everybody, welcome back to another episode of the program. Today we are going to talk about something called the Zand motor and the dredging of the seabed underneath the North Sea, also known as Doggerland. And there, there's a ton of stuff that they've uh, unearthed. And I talked a, a little bit about Aquaterra and um, the ELF project, which uh, we'll talk about uh, later on in the episode. But this is a really, really interesting case. Some of you have probably heard of this. I've been meaning to do an episode on this, but um, uh, this this article came up a few days ago, and I, I it's just blown my mind. So uh, the first thing that we should talk about is this place called Monster Netherlands. Now, uh, this is one of the places where they're using this thing called the Zand motor, which is basically uh, what I mentioned earlier, this dredging device that... Um, is essentially it's there because it's a cost-effective measure to keep the beach uh, from disappearing. Um, it, it's protecting the N Netherlands from uh, the, their beaches basically getting sucked up by the tide. So what it does is it dredges the some of the sand underneath the what, the cold waters of the North Sea, and it brings them back and it essentially rebuilds the beach. And it's a lot cheaper to do this than um, other ways of replenishing it um, from what I've read. So this technique is very interesting because they're going to start employing it in the UK and probably in, in Beringia. Uh, but I, I, th I think it's a really fascinating story. And so this article centers around one of these beachcombers because the beach is constantly getting renewed with, with this sand that is basically a time capsule. They found st stuff as old as 800,000 years. So um, we'll get into that in a second. So uh, other things they found are uh, human remains, weapons, woolly mammoth tooth, f over 500 ancient artifacts by one person, by this one person uh, mentioned in the article. But there are tons of beachcombers that are going there, and there's so much stuff that they're finding that they just they literally <laughs> can't keep up. Um, so uh, what some archaeologists and, and other scientists have done is they've opened up like a hotline group chat type of situation where they establish a direct communication with the beachcombers and these, uh, these scientists. And they, they uh, are reported on, on the daily of the, of the beachcombers' find. Let's just get into uh, this article here. So uh, the beach that they're combing is nearly half a kilometer wide. The material, again, dredged from the sea bottom 13 kilometers offshore and dumped on the existing beach starting in 2012, I think. Um, it costs 70 uh, million a year, euro. And it, again, all this experimental, but it's yielded a ton of results. So far, they've made 21 million cubic meters of Stone Age soil accessible to archaeologists. So again, that's a lot of soil to, to uh, sift through. It kind of reminds me of, uh, if you guys seen Spaceballs, that movie by Mel Brooks, um, when they literally comb the sand, they have like a giant comb. That's kind of <laughs> like what they're doing. <laughs> they're they're uh, literally dredging this stuff up, and it's incredible what they've found and all the conclusions that they're that they've already reached and still what what's yet to be uh, found so um doggerland if you guys don't know by the way this is what the zan motor looks like it's uh this th this sand being dredged this is the sand being dredged up from the north sea and yeah it's keeping the netherlands afloat because otherwise the netherlands would just keep sinking and sinking under the water allegedly so here's Doggerland. So on the left, I think I've shown this image in a previous episode, but it's a good image. And so this is the British Isles and the sunken uh, Doggerland area. This is what it uh, more or less looks like now. And then about 7,000 uh, BC, between 16,000 and 7,000 BC, this is what it looked like. So um, in 16,000 BC, this is still uh, what Doggerland was. And then there was some sort of tsunami that came from uh, Nor the direction of Norway that, that sunk everything. And then right here, underneath the Dogger Bank, is this ancient lake here. And then if you go back even further to the LGM, the last glacial maximum, around 20,000 BC, you can see that most of Doggerland 
and uh, the modern day UK are underneath this ice sheet and th that uh, glacial lake is still there. So these are the, low the, the English channels gone by the way too. And you can see that these lowlands were exposed. So this is what we're talking about here. Um, so, oh, another thing, when you look at the left, this part of the Netherlands is right here, basically. Somewhere here, monster somewhere here. So um, with that in mind, let's look at uh, some of the things I found. So within this rich lowland, they, they found out it was home to modern humans, Neanderthals, and earlier hominins, specifically Homo antecessor, which goes back 800,000 years ago or so, um, allegedly. And there, again, there's that date uh, that I talked about with Bruce Fenton very briefly, 800,000 years, 750,000 to 800,000 years ago. Um, something definitely was going on. There are definitely humans. There are definitely uh, ad more advanced than we uh, believe that they were. And because they had tools and all this stuff, um, and probably a language, who knows, but it, th there's a way more going on back then than we initially thought. That's 100% sure. Um, so these beachcombers are amassing an impressive collection of artifacts that vanish from the landscape. Uh, they've dated some of the artifacts. They sequenced a lot of the, the genes. I think they've sequenced about five individuals so far. Um, in the span of one day, they found 50 sc uh, skull fragments. So that's the level of stuff we're talking about. Um, they're, they're doing a bunch of other stuff too, besides, uh, sequencing these, uh, the DNA or the DNA that they can sequence. They're also mapping the seafloor. They've gotten, um, some information from oil companies who've also done some of that legwork as well, mapping the coastlines. Um, and then they, they're also, uh, drilling and analyzing these sediment cores, which we'll get into uh, a little bit later. So again, this is stuff that. Uh, I've talked about in past episodes and a lot of you guys were commenting on that. Why aren't they doing more uh, marine archaeology in Doggerland? Why aren't they doing this? Why aren't they doing that? Um, the long and short of that was there was just no interest. There was no, the only interests there were, were again, like these, these commercial interests for other things, not for the sake of science, but really for, um, for commerce and, and, um, and making money. So, um, what was Doggerland like back then, then uh, around the, the before the Younger Dryas boundary and, and all that? Well, it was a it was a rich lowland. Um, there were forests, river valleys. It was game rich. So it was a very ideal place to live. 180,000 square kilometers of just some of the, the, the most prime real estate out there. So there's no there's no surprise that there are a lot of uh different occupations going on here first by these um, archaic humans and then later by neanderthals and then homo sapiens uh, allegedly there might be even more uh people who uh, different populations that have gone through that area when it was exposed um so all of this stuff is coming up the the water of the north sea is especially cold so it it's really good for preserving a lot of organic material which is why a bunch of stuff is being dredged up other stuff that's being dredged up are cemeteries. Entire cemeteries are being uh, brought to the forefront. And those are just cemeteries alone are, are indicative of so many things that probably of religion, um, the idea of an afterlife. Uh, they cared about uh, uh, their dead enough to bury them. There, there's ritual, uh, again, religion, all of these things. So. Um, this is a, lo a large span of stuff that dates to a large span of time, uh, again, as old as 800,000 years and as, as recently as 7,000 years ago. Um, so again, the region was an inviting place. They're one of the best areas for hunter gatherers. So up until, uh, this dredging, uh, fishermen, there have been countless, uh, local reports of fishermen dragging up. Isolated bones, tusks, stone tools, weapons, uh, uh, again, body parts. I guess that would fall under uh, isolated bones um, and all these things. So it has been long been speculated that people were occupying this, this area. So it's not, it's not anything new. It's just no one's really gone the full, full nine yards of, uh, of exploring the dang thing. 
So here's an interesting thing about Doggerland. Over the millennia, Doggerland has been an icy wasteland, a verdant valley and forest. Um, now it's the bottom of the North Sea. So it's gone under like the gauntlet of, of what nature could could uh, throw at it. And then it was buried underneath a glacier for, for 100,000 years or so. Um, this is another uh, map of this. It, it's pretty detailed, more detailed than the other one. So here's Dogger Bank. It doesn't show that that uh, that lake, that ancient lake there, like in the other um, map. Um, but yeah, you can see uh, like the Orkney Islands and then Shetland Islands. So again, it, some of you guys that live in this area, please leave some comments about what what you've heard about Doggerland, and maybe you've heard some local stuff that I haven't covered here. But um, I guess the thing that that most recently happened to Doggerland that put it underneath all this water was a, a, a tsunami that came from uh, nor the direction of Norway. So it would be up here. So it's very interesting. And again, that could be associated with a glacial lake uh, bursting and, and, and over flooding kind of like um, uh, glacial Lake Agassiz, which is in North America. Um, maybe something like that was going on or, uh, or a common impact or, or something, something happened that destabilized that ice sheet at the time. So I mentioned the, the, the core samples. So, um, the older layers of the core, core the sediment samples that they found, the, it yielded terrestrial type of animals. So boars, bears, uh, some types of birds, low flying birds. And then in the younger layers, it switches to more a more marine type of fauna, a more marine type of taxa. So we had fish bones and uh, uh, marshy plants and stuff like that. So you, through these core samples, you could see the ecosystem just transitioning very quickly too. Um, so again, there's a there's a lot of stuff um, that they got from the cores. Another thing that they got from the core was. Around 16,000, 15,000 years ago, there was a warming period. They found um, pollen and, and other types of flowers that, that are indicative of a warming climate. And if you guys go look up the balling Alarod period, right after the last glacial maximum, there was the, this period of climate uh, where it was warming. It was kind of like the medieval warming period of a few hundred years ago that brought forth the enlightenment, all these uh, things like that. Well, they found this in the core samples as well. And that kind of coincides with the climate data that the balling Alarod period, it was warming. And then the younger Dryas happens right after that. And then you get uh, a sudden rise and then fall uh, back to ice age conditions for, for that uh, period of, of uh, 1600 years or so. So again, it's very interesting to see um, a core sample like this coincide with some of the climate data that I've talked about in the past. Okay, so let's talk about some of the stuff that Van Wingerden found. She, she's one of the beachcombers. She found a, a flint f uh, flake with the gob of tar stuck to uh, one end that formed a simple handle. So again, um, the Neanderthal hand tool that's around 50,000 years old, this proves a bunch of things. They, they not only were Neanderthals uh, sophisticated enough to create tools they use complex methods to pr process birch bark into tar i know a few of you guys talked about that in the comments and i've talked about this in a few uh, episodes in the past but again we're we start seeing more and more of this evidence of neanderthals being much more than just knuckle draggers and and very uh low uh, very lowly and unsophisticated type of people it, quite the contrary they seem to be very smart they seem to be artistic because they they also did some paintings as well um cave paintings and all all of this type of stuff so they had they had techniques they had skills and they used them for sure i also talked about the 50 human skull fragments in one day uh, the complete cemeteries that they're they've been uh uh sucked up and sprayed on beaches that must be a sight in and of itself. I couldn't find any pictures of that, but that must be insane. Um, footprints that indicate children and families were walking on mud flats. So again, you, you, this evidence of this transition from a lush lowland, that's, again, the land must have been so rich and fertile and so attractive. It was even more attractive than the highlands in the UK, um, the modern day UK, UK 
and in other parts of the mainland. So once it, people wasted very little time, once the land was exposed, they went in and they settled it and they lived off the land. So that should tell you something. Um, these findings suggest several phases of occupation. I mentioned this earlier. So um, 800,000 years ago, they found these tools, that, which they think uh, belong to Homo antecessor, um, which many thought to be evolutionary dead end. I think more and more now, um, uh, archaic humans like antecessor are probably, they're probably vi sexually viable uh, with us. Um, obviously, we, we don't have any proof for that, but I th just with everything else that's coming out, I think that um, not enough time has passed for them to rise in Homo sapiens. That's why sapiens and Denisovans and Neanderthals were able to mate and have viable offspring because they weren't they they didn't branch off that far from us. Um, so again, yeah, the jury's still out on that, but I think this uh, this information node again kind of lends credence to this idea that. Um, we're not distant cousins. We're very, very uh, closely uh, bond bonded together genetically and biologically than we than we uh, want to think. So, hundred thousand years ago, that's the earliest evidence of, of occupation. And then, if you fast forward about a hundred thousand, hundred twenty thousand years ago, we start seeing the Neanderthals coming in hunting megafauna because they did find some um, mammoth teeth and, and all these other uh, big game animals that they were hunting. And then about 45,000 years ago, Neanderthals die out. And then we see the earliest occupation of Homo sapiens in the area. They're active around 40 to 42,000 years ago. And then after, at the last glacial max, maximum 20,000 years ago, it becomes too cold to occupy. And again, um, uh, if you see here the extent of the ice sheet 20,000 years ago, you can just see most of Doggerland is just, just under ice. So it's really a tough sell to, 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 to live off the land there when there's a giant block of ice just sitting there. <laughs> um, 15,000 years ago, with the pollen samples, like I mentioned earlier, it started to warm again. Um, it suggests a fertile landscape, and it suggests that people would come in and, and start, again, living off the land. And then 14,000 or so years ago, Younger Dryas happens. And then after, in the wake of the Younger Dryas, these modern Europeans that come from the south, whether it's most likely they're coming from Turkey and Gobekli Tepe and, and Asia Minor and, and probably uh, the Balkans areas. But the, these people come in, and then this is where most uh, modern Europeans today trace their ancestry. Um, most. Okay, not all of them, most. Um, some of the researchers from the Max Planck Institute, they start identifying teeth and bones between 8,000 and 10,000 years old when modern hunter-gatherers occupied Doggerland. Now, modern human hunter-gatherers, who knows really what they were. Maybe some of them were hunter-gatherers. Maybe some of them were farmers. Maybe some of these people were um, remnants from a lost civilization that had these skills. Uh we don't really know for sure, but the scientists usually refer to them as uh, hum modern human hunter gatherers, just because of uh, just for the sake of of argument, I guess they just have that. Um, they just call them that. Um, they started to extract DNA. They've so far recovered it from more than five individuals, and um, as some of the stuff they found is pretty interesting. The DNA could eliminate how, how these early populations mixed with others in Europe. So. I what to expect from in the wake of all this is we're going to start being able to delineate some of their movements um, further and further back uh, in history. Um, we're and then once we do that, we can probably, we can kind of see what the early population's genetic makeup was, who they mated with, when they went where. All of these uh, questions will most likely be answered as they continue on with this um th these types of uh, beach combing and and um dredging up the, the ground and what better way to do it um i remember one i forgot who commented on this but one of you guys commented about uh using some sort of laser or seismic um not seismic a sonar type of uh mapping just to map the floor 
And I think that would be a good time now to, to do that, especially with in tandem with this uh, uh, dredging, this Zan motor thing. They did receive funding to deploy the side scan sonar and other end undersea imaging technologies to make their own maps and what they call the ELF project, the Europe's Lost Frontiers project. I've mentioned it in the past called Aquaterra project. Either way, it's the same thing. They're trying to map and look for these ancient areas that were suited to human habitation in the remote past. And even to this day, the, um, some of the stuff that exists, that still exists there, dates dating back thousands and thousands of years, they're trying to find all of these hot spots. And this is a, a jawbone, I think. Yeah, a jawbone from an ancient teenager found in underneath the North Sea. So you can see how intact this stuff is, um, even though uh, it's been so long. It's been thousands of years. It, literally, these, these artifacts are being put on ice and preserved. So there's a lot of stuff to work with here. It's just a matter of getting it all out. And I mean, again, if we look at the map, it's... There's a lot of land to cover, and I'm, they're only getting uh, just, they're only scratching the surface on, on some of the stuff that's out there. So who knows? And if people had cemeteries, then I don't know if they were just hunter gatherers. Um, they must have been sticking around for a while. So uh, maybe they were just patrolling that area, the 180,000 square kilometer area. Maybe they're just following the flocks. Who knows? But uh, if they have cemeteries, I don't, I don't know if they were just strictly hunter-gatherers. Um, so, so yeah, they took more core samples. They found traces of a fossilized forest 32 meters beneath the waves. They found tree roots, snail, terrestrial snail shells. Um, again, broken flint hammerstone. All of these things that they found, and these are just peripheral things who knows what else that they'll find maybe they'll find like a, a structure or something like that or the remnants of a structure maybe they'll find um like a, a some some elaborate tomb or the remnants of the tomb or whatever maybe there is a, a very important individual maybe they'll find someone with elongated heads there who knows we really don't know uh, 8,500 years ago, a massive freshwater lake in North America called Lake Agassiz. Oh, I already talked about this earlier. The melting glaciers it drained suddenly into the sea. So something like that may have happened. Um, Doggerland transformed from a temperate forested plain into an estuarial wetland dotted by drier highlands. Core samples collected along river valleys by the Lost Frontiers team traced the flooding amounting to a transect through time. And basically, um, they think it... Uh, Again, I mentioned the tsunami earlier coming from Norway. Uh, he goes on to trace the bones to 18 offshore sites around the prehistoric Rhine River estuary and dated them with radiocarbon to a precision of about 100 years, all were about 8,500 years old. So that's 6,500 years ago. That's right before the, the, the dawn of, of the Copper Age um, and into the Bronze Age, depending on where you are. Um, just a couple thousand years uh, before that starts kicking off. So who, what were the connections of these people to those people who were mining copper and other ores? Are they related? Are they completely different people with completely different technology? What's their relation to the Sami people in the north uh, uh, near Finland and, and, and all the way stretching east to Siberia? Are they related at all? These are all burning questions that I think the answers are will come out feasibly uh, within the next few years or so. Um, they even they even witnessed the landscape changing and the diet of, of the people living there changing too. Again, from land animals to freshwater fish. Um, 6150 BC, some some uh, tsunami again. That's pretty recent. Um, again, 8500 or so years ago, shit hit the fan there. Um, this is a 13,000-year-old skull fa fragment here. So again, there's just so much stuff going on here. Um, so uh, well, let me know what you guys think about this. Should we apply this to Beringia? If we do apply this to Beringia, what will we find? Do you think we'll even find anything? 99.9%, I'm pretty sure they'll find something. Um, they have to. They have to. 
Um, they should probably do this in other areas of interest of, as well, like the China, Channel Islands near California, um, the East Coast, maybe near Florida and in, in, in Central America. That, that would be great. Um, near Belém, modern day Belém, Brazil, uh, uh, where, where the uh, Amazon uh, exit drains into the Atlantic. That would be a great spot as well. Um, so anyway, let me know what you guys think about Doggerland, about uh, the Zan motor, all of these things. What, what, what was it like to live there in Doggerland 16,000 years ago, 25,000 years ago, 40,000 years ago? What was going on there? Um, and that's about it, guys. Thanks for uh, tuning in, and I'll have another episode this weekend sometime. Thanks.